thank you, Steve, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, it's a real honor and a privilege. Uh, my history with the MPS disorders and with the society are uh, uh, things that I'm very proud of. When I started working with Mark Haskins in um, uh, 1998, we were starting to see development of therapy for MPS-1 with amylcacus. And in the early 2000s, of course, that came to fruition. And we've now seen, as Joe has detailed, so many therapies developed. It's been a real thrill to see the field develop. Um, I also wanted to thank the society because in some ways I am here today because of you, because of the history of researchers that you've supported in the past, like Mark Haskins, who gave me my start, uh, because of the postdoctoral fellowship that I had that helped launch my independent investigator career, because of the research grant that I used during my postdoc with Mark. All of those things kept me in the field uh, and helped establish me uh, so that I'm now a stable, tenured uh, researcher in the area. So it's nice to come visit with you guys and give back uh, because the society has been very important to me professionally. So um, Joe set the background for uh, a lot of what I'll talk about today and I'd like to give you sort of an overview of how I think about these disorders from a therapeutic standpoint from sort of the 30,000 foot level. Um, and we'll talk about some of the developments in some areas, particularly for diseases that have bone involvement and that may not be amenable to enzyme therapy. And that includes, of course, the mucolipidoses. Um, and we'll also I'll wind up by talking about a recent uh, grant that's just been awarded from the NIH to Patty Dixon and I to help improve biomarker identification for central nervous system disorders. So as you know, the lysosomal storage diseases are caused by abnormal uh, function and uh, or cell death. There's accumulation of primary substrates. So you will recognize these substrates for the MPS disorders, heparin sulfate, dermatan sulfate, keratan sulfate, et cetera. There are also accumulations of other substrates or compounds gangliosidosis, unesterified cholesterol, subunit C of ATPA synthase, and these may also cause pathology. But the, in the end, the disease we see in patients is a very complex interaction between the specific substrate accumulated, heparin sulfate versus dermatan sulfate, which gives you San Filippo syndrome versus Marteau-Lemay syndrome. The tissues affected, what tissues are accumulating those substrates? Is there any residual activity? Does the mutation that the patient have give a small percentage of activity that may attenuate the disease, such as we see in Shea syndrome? And more importantly, the sensitivity of any given tissue to the pathological effects of substrate. We see a lot of substrate storage in liver. The patients don't have serious clinical liver disease when you compare it to the bone and brain disease they have. Clearly, brain and bone are very sensitive to these uh, substrate accumulations. And this is just what we see in terms of substrate in a neuron. This is a dog cell, a brain cell with MPS3B. And of course, all those blue granules are um, both primary and secondary stored substrates in the neurons of the brain. Clinically, these are, as you know, pediatric diseases. They're chronic and progressive. And we see, can see clinical variability due to family genetic background. Uh, the variability you might see between siblings, and then also we see variability because of the mutations that cause the disease. Is it an attenuated form, or is it a severe form? So, approaches to therapy. I pretty much divide things into threes. I tend to like lumping stuff. And one approach for those diseases that we can treat with a soluble enzyme, unfortunately that doesn't include uh, MPS3C or the mucolipidoses, we have some enzyme-based therapy. It could be in vitro uh, produced enzyme that's infused for enzyme replacement therapy. That enzyme could come from a transplant. It could come from a gene therapy. And in fact, optimal therapy involving enzymes probably going to involve a combination of these things when we get to um, a perfected treatment for uh, these disorders. And then there's something called enzyme optimization therapy. Uh, and in that category, I put chaperone in therapy, a small drug that may improve the level of enzyme already in the patient. 
And then there's, a, of course, a class of drugs. They're a, a type of antibiotic. And for specific mutations in patients that have stop codons, they have a specific DNA mutation that leads to a stop in the protein translation. We could get stop codon read-through for those drugs. But again, that's specific to certain um, patients. That is a particular approach that might be useful for enzyme, uh, patients who have membrane-bound uh, protein disease. So Sanfilippo 3C, and for the mucolipidoses, small codon or stop codon read-through is a potential therapy uh, for those patients um, uh, that could lead to not enzyme optimization, but protein um, optimization. And then decrease the storage burden, and we do that through substrate uh, level manipulation, and Joe talked about that. Genistein, of course, is the product that you guys uh, know about for that. And importantly now, we're starting to identify significant treatment options in animal models that treat the disease uh, progression, the disease cascade that we see. And this is primarily being seen in bone disorders, and this is an important development in animal models that will have application um, to bone disease and also to some of the uh, uh, membrane-bound diseases, the mucolipidoses. Uh, echoing Joe's comment on the difficulty of treating bone disease, Mark Haskins in a gene therapy study involving SLI syndrome, MPS7, he was able to treat dogs as early as seven days of li or three days of life. He got, in some animals, a hundred times normal enzymes throughout their entire lives. And the last dog in that study was sacrificed a year ago this December. He had significant cervical neck uh, spine disease. And so uh, even when we get very high levels of enzyme, there's still some untreatable aspects of bone disease. So these um, drug treatments that can address bone disease are going to be really important, I think, to uh, provide a full uh, approach to therapy for our patients. So are we making progress? There's so much that's been done in the last couple of decades. And of course, as you guys know, this is a coordinated effort between uh, support groups that you guys are part of, um, biopharma companies. I'd like to highlight, of course, uh, academic medical and veterinary uh, researchers. The MPS disorders and the ML disorders have been beneficiaries of a long history of uh, veterinary model development. And you have people like Mark Haskins, John Wolfe, Charles Veet, uh, myself, Henry Baker, Steve Walkley, all of whom are veterinarians and have been dedicated to this field with great productivity. Uh, and of course, the NIH. And I have some uh, disturbing statistics to share with you in just a moment about funding at the NIH level. And we have, are making great therapy uh, strides in therapy already. Licensed or approved in trials are the uh, therapies for these disorders that Joe uh, detailed for you. This is an image of current R01 research dedicated. I just did a search for mucopolysaccharidoses. And there are um, 16 grants out there at the research level, R01 level. That's the workhorse research grant. All, uh, the vast majority of these grants, nine of them, come up for renewal next year. That means those grants have been submitted and are being reviewed now. I don't need to tell you what the budget climate is like uh, in this country. Um, and we, we are sort of at a crux point whether this level of grants will get renewed. I certainly hope they will. Some of these grants go back 26 years and are providing important data. But uh, I know you guys are all active, but encourage everybody you know to help support the NIH and the budgetary process, because it's really our lifeblood. I think of the regulatory issues I face on a day-to-day -day basis running a lab. The biggest burden is animal care regulations. The second is dealing with my accountants. Because the NIH may be slow to renew grants, you can't know how much of a burden that is not having things functioning uh, well at a funding level. Uh, that's just even after we get the grants. So I know you're doing your bit. Try and get everybody you know to do their bit, too. So current impediments to therapy. Uh, these are sort of big, broad categories. Treating diseases that don't involve a soluble enzyme. So that'll be MPS3C and the mucolipidoses. What are the potentials there? The potentials involve things like chaperonin-based therapy that can help protein get to where it belongs or stop codon read-through. These are drugs that will hopefully get to the entire body, bone and brain as well, 
And uh, the problem here is they're not a one-size-fits-all. They may be very mutation-specific, and that is a big challenge. It's not like enzyme where uh, um, igeronidase enzyme is going to treat all forms of MPS1 that aren't central nervous system. Um, another approach would be those drugs that will address bone disease, right? Uh, and they're not really treating the root cause. They're treating the pathological cascades within the cells that are causing damage. Getting enzyme across the blood-brain barrier, and Joe talked about that. And we have the ability to do it both uh, by, as it were, brute force, just injecting it into the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a model that I use, and that's being pursued uh, therapeutically. And then also a ton of companies are working on trying to get receptor-mediated uptake from the peripheral blood. Getting enzyme to the bone or getting other therapeutics to the bone. That's why using small molecule therapies may be so attractive. A penetration to the bone of enzyme is not optimal, and Mark Haskins' dog studies have showed that to us. Getting to patients before we see irreversible uh, disease processes set in. And that uh, gets to neonatal testing. It's my understanding that MPS1 is now being tested for at the neonatal phase in Illinois. There was a trial that um, went forward in Washington successfully, and they've instituted it in Illinois. That still leaves a big challenge. We may get diagnoses reliably, but how severe are those diseases going to be in the children? If you get an MPS1 diagnosis in a newborn, is that going to be a Shea syndrome or a Hurler syndrome? And the choices that you make for therapy are going to vary quite widely. But at least we have some technology to do it. And that technology should be um, available to treat or to identify other MPS disorders as we have therapies moving forward that can help get kids on therapy before uh, irreversible disease is set in. An area that I think is very important that I am working on is finding validated biomarkers. I think as Joe has alluded to, we have such a small patient population. Enrolling patients in clinical trials can be difficult, especially as we have improved um, uh, approaches to treatment, refinements to products, finding a new patient population is going to be difficult. If we can find biomarkers that will help us both use animal models and help us um, identify uh, improvements to therapy in children uh, that may not require such large groups or difficult testing, uh, this will be really important. So one of the areas that I think is one of the most exciting things to come uh, around recently and has been funded directly by the society involves the work of Leela Simonaro at Sinai in New York and Richard Steet at the University of Georgia in Athens. And these really speak to issues of orthopedic disease and inflammatory pathways. And they have incredible potential uh, to develop therapeutics. And they involve some really odd uh, uh, model systems. For those of you who've been part of the society for a while, you've heard Mark Haskins speak about the dog and cat models, but zebrafish, those things that your kids may have in fish tanks, these are incredibly powerful models, and Richard Steet's been one of the first to use those in this field uh, with very, very good effect in terms of identifying the mechanism of disease that we see in the mucolipidoses. So Leela Simonaro uh, and uh, her husband, Ed Shookman, have been working on the MPS disorders um, for decades. Uh, Leela particularly is concentrated on uh, bone-associated disease in MPS-6. And with a rat model, she's dissected out some of the basic um, pathology that we see in cartilage and bone associated with the substrate accumulation in that disease, dermatan sulfate. And she's found that uh, tumor necrosis alpha is a really big player in this disorder, and that using some of the um, therapeutics available for things like rheumatoid arthritis can drastically reduce the clinical signs she sees in rats. When I started uh, working on these diseases with Mark in 98, I thought, that's not possible. That the, the disease was so profoundly associated with just architectural disturbance of the growth of bone. I didn't think it was much of an inflammatory disease. But our understanding has really moved very far forward so that a drug can significantly improve um, uh, the clinical signs associated disease. And when you combine that um, drug with enzyme, uh, as Leela has done in this paper, um, uh, you can get really impressive results. So um, Joe 
mentioned an important cautionary note that we may not see as much significant um, uh, inflammation in the human patients as we do in the animal models, but I still think that this therapy is incredibly exciting uh, in terms of opening up avenues uh, for treatment with drugs that may already be approved. And as you guys have heard, if you've sat through any um, research updates, FDA approval is a huge barrier to overcome. Uh, this is the um, paper recently published on pentosan polysulfate, and this is again that licensed drug that Leela has been able to show provides significant improvement um, for the bone disease uh, in um, the MPS6 uh, models. And again, Leela has been uh, the support uh, supported by the, uh, uh, the MPS Society, and that support has directly led to a recent NIH award that she has for this work. Richard Steet is a researcher working on mucolipidosis 2 in Athens, Georgia, and he is a zebrafish model guy. Um, zebrafish are incredibly valuable models. Uh, they're small. You can study embryos. Embryos can be the subjects of high-throughput drug studies. Uh, they are produced 400 at a time. Uh, they go through synchronous development. There are all sorts of really attractive things about them. Uh, recently, I've started working with zebrafish, and I was talking to my collaborator, Jeff Esner, and we were preparing a budget, and I said, Jeff, how much money should I budget for animal costs? And he said, $500. I work with dogs. $500 is, oh, I don't know, a couple dogs for a month. Um, and I said, that's $500 a month? And he said, no. That's $500 for a year for up to three lines of zebrafish. So they're incredibly economical, um, between 100 and uh, 10 times less expensive. The ability to generate true knockout zebrafish is now available to us. It costs about $250, and it takes six weeks. That is an incredible improvement. We are now embarking on an effort to create zebrafish models for all the MPS and ML disorders. Uh, and beyond that, we're looking at actually making models for all the lysosomal storage diseases. The technology has just boomed in that area. So incredibly powerful. Uh, Richard was uh, uh, working in this area back when uh, developing models was a little bit more difficult, and he's found some really important areas involving the cell biology of bone disease, looking at chondrocyte differentiation. So this is a cartilage cell uh, development. Uh, and the extracellular matrix, which are those proteins hanging out uh, in the extracellular space that are uh, heavily decorated with gags, and uh, specifically in uh, mucolipidosis. And he's gone from both the characterization phase to actually finding out the proteins that are involved in the pathology. And once you identify the proteins involved, there will be messenger systems activating those proteins. You get a messenger system, you can disrupt it with a drug. And that principle is available in treating a lot of diseases that aren't lysosomal storage diseases. So this basic kind of therapy uh, that Richard's pursuing with the support of first the National MPS Society and now the NIH are going to be really critical to bringing uh, a better understanding and a target for drug therapy to fruition. So I wanted to talk about an area of work that I've been pursuing with Patty Dixon. Um, I'm reminded at the first MPS meeting that I attended in UCLA, which was a combined science and family meeting, uh, at the last day when all of the researchers and the families were meeting together, one family member got up, a parent, and said, I want to know that you guys are working together because I worry that you're competing and you're um, not using resources widely. One of the things I really value about the MPS Society and about MPS research is how collegial and um, uh, what a great environment it is to be a researcher uh, in this field. I work with Patty Dixon, and Patty Dixon has assembled a group of researchers at Minnesota, at Duke, um, at uh, uh, Tennessee, at University of Pennsylvania, at Iowa State University, all across the country, and we work very collaboratively uh, to push forward the science. So it's been a great community to work with, and um, Patty has uh, put forward an area of work involving MRI of dog brains. So this was an extension of a 
uh, uh, National, uh, uh, National Institutes of Health grant that I had with Patty, looking at intrathecal enzyme therapy. We were injecting enzyme into the cisterna magna, which is the uh, um, cerebrospinal fluid access point we use for dogs. And we were able to pretty much eliminate storage in the brain. Furthermore, we had a model to reduce in, uh, uh, immune, immune reactions against the enzyme uh, with this model. Uh, and we were able to do a really good job of treating, but we wanted to go back and revisit that work and to, de and to develop a better understanding of how we could image the brain that could impact development of therapy for kids. The preliminary work for this paper was published recently, um, and some of that I will show to you, and then we'll also talk about what this paper and this collaboration have yielded so far. So um, uh, this June, uh, after five tries, Patty was awarded an NIH grant that we are a substantial uh, contributor to, and it involves neuroimaging. So that's MRI of dog brains and neuropathology in MPS1. Um, and uh, it's been a very gratifying road uh, to, to travel, even though there was a big long spell in terms of funding. Uh, dry spell. So imaging has a really distinct advantage when it comes to developing biomarkers of disease. You heard Joe talk about the number of patients we could evaluate for cognition, and there were a lot that you just couldn't evaluate, whether they had orthopedic disease or ocular disease. Testing patients can be very difficult, and discriminating patients who have had previous therapy and figuring that into the assessments can be difficult as well. If we had the ability to go in and image with an MRI certain structures in the brain and know that those structures were tied to cognitive function, it would be incredibly valuable to validating whether a therapy is an improvement uh, over untreated disease or other approaches to treatment. So we were very excited about using neuroimaging. It is non-invasive. Uh, and it can track both architecture of brain structures, and by extension, it can tell us something about the function. Um, and we were going to use the MPS1 dog model um, with and without intrathecal therapy. We'd already validated that we could treat the brain disease by intrathecal enzyme therapy uh, through studies that Patty had done looking at injection and penetration of enzyme into deep structures throughout the brain and spinal cord. We had a long-term study out to 18 months that was published a couple years ago in Science Translational Medicine where we were achieving supra-physiological levels of enzyme with intrathecal uh, enzyme injection. Uh, up here is sort of a fancy shot of uh, a specific kind of brain imaging of a specific structure called the corpus or called the hippocampus. This is an MPS1 dog, and this is a normal dog. And what I want you to focus on is how generally structured that particular image is. And these are all what we call white matter tracks, axon paths within a deep structure in the brain. This is an MPS1 dog, and look at how confused that is. Those are the sorts of findings we're identifying, and those are the sorts of things we're going to try and quantify. So we're going to use, I'm going to introduce some, uh, some in big, tech, uh, big tech terms here. Diffusion tensor imaging. This is a specific kind of MRI finding. MRIs, as you may know, are just incredibly powerful magnets. The standard clinical magnet is something called a 1.5 Tesla magnet. And uh, uh, we're going to be using seven Tesla magnets in these dogs uh, to try and identify structures. And basically, we're looking at how much water moves um, uh, in random directions. These are MPS1 dogs from our preliminary study. These are treated dogs, and these are normal dogs. So look at how much better the treated are than the affected. These are the approaches that we're trying to identify. We're running late, so I'm going to try and blow through the rest of the slides in the best way possible. One of the big structures we're finding problems in is something called the corpus callosum, which is a structure of white matter that connects the two hemispheres. This is a normal animal, and you can see that white area is the corpus callosum. It's nice and thick. This is an untreated animal. Look at how thin and attenuated that corpus callosum is. They've lost white matter. And this is a treated animal. So we think we already have a sign of disease we can see on MRI that responds to therapy. 
Um, and again, you just go in and draw out the outlines of the corpus callosum. You can measure them. They're statistically significant. We're also finding abnormalities in the myelin, which is the wrapping of lipid around the axons in the white matter as well. So we're finding biochemical defects that we can see on um, imaging. And these are all different DTI measurements. The bottom line is an affected animal has disrupted white matter. Treated animals have improvements uh, uh, relative to that. And we also see uh, a, a correlation with these um, uh, DTI findings and the biochemical findings, measurements of myelin, et cetera. So imaging studies, we like them. They're very attractive. We can quantify these. They seem to be reproducible. They talk about deep structures in the brain where enzyme has to penetrate. And we believe they're tied to function in terms of attention and cognition. And we think they represent the best and most practically clinically relevant tool to help push uh, therapies through evaluation. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, the team that Patty Dixon has assembled that I'm very proud to be a part of. Uh, my group at Iowa State, uh, the LA Biomed group headed up by Patty, University of Minnesota, uh, we have a cognitive psychologist, Ilsa Shapiro and Igor Nistrissel, who is the imaging man, pathologist at Tennessee, imaging people at Duke, and a veterinary imaging person, Charles Veet, at University of Pennsylvania. Um, we are also pushing forward to try and link these image data to cognitive function in dogs. So this is a great project for one of my graduate students. She gets to play with dogs all day. So she's teaching dogs how to run through mazes. Um, so a lot of it right now is carpentry. I don't know whether she feels like she's not being used very uh, 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 in a sophisticated project because it's all um, uh, carpentry at this point, but you have to build those structures, right? Uh, so we are building a team, we have a team maze built, we're building what we call a foraging maze and a radial arm maze to try and evaluate the mental function of the dogs and correlate that with the MRI findings. Um, I talked to you briefly about the zebrafish models we're producing uh, with Jeff Esner. I'm also working on the dog uh, MPS3B model for the UO1 grant with Hai An Fu at Children's Nationwide. And through funding um, from uh, Jonah's Just Begun and uh, Ben's Dream, we are in, I think they're just injecting um, homologous recombined embryonic stem cells into blastocysts to generate an MPS3D mouse so we can start moving therapy forward with that disease. Um, of course, I'd like to thank the MPS Society and over the years, uh, Canadian uh, family support that we've received, and of course, support from um, the Ryan Foundation has been instrumental for Patty's and my work over the years. Uh, and of course, I love taking part in the runs when we used to have them over in Cedar Rapids. We'd get the whole lab together and go over. Uh, and uh, those are really rewarding experiences to be part of, I gotta say. And also my general collaborators I'd like to thank. Uh, and I'd like to wrap it up with questions. Thanks. So we have a student now who just ordered what we call talons, which are these approaches to develop them. Um, we expect her to have an MPS-6 and an MPS-3B uh, model by the end of her rotation, which is eight weeks. So those animals will be young fish. Um, it takes about an hour to inject a uh, hundred embryos with the structures that will disrupt the gene. So we'll develop some of those fish for germline transmission so that they are a stable model and then we'll take other individuals and just do pathology on them. So um, we expect to have a poster for this uh, submitted to World by December 1st. Um, yeah. So you can move very, very quickly. It's six weeks to get uh, um, from design of your uh, what they call talons to uh, an an uh, a young animal, an embryo. Additional questions, yes? Hi, Matt. Oh, hi there, Jill. <laughs> um, I'm really curious, the zebrafish, how do you, com besides economic-wise, how do you compare them to the mice? I mean, 
Can't really get fish to run through a maze? Uh, no, but you can track their movement. So if they're hanging out in their little tank, you can have visual trackers. You can evaluate their behavior. They have these little whirly gig things. Uh, fish want to school, right? Okay. So there will be little whirly gig things that go around in the tank, and their desire to follow it or not is based on whether their normal schooling behavior is disruptive. So there is actually a lot of stuff. I know, when I started to hear about this, I thought. But they're, I think they're very powerful. They're really... Um, not the preclinical model we want uh, in the dog, um, but they are just so cheap. Um, and, and we can do so much so quickly. So if we get a mucolipidosis model and we want to find out what substrate is the most, we can go ahead and take an eye cell model and immediately disrupt every other lysosomal storage disease gene and see whether there's some synergistic effect. It's just incredibly powerful. Okay. We need videos next time. I, I, uh, next time we'll have some fish videos. Thanks. <laughs> so, so for MPS diseases, there's going to be several generations where we have treatment but no newborn screening. Yeah. And so we're going to have generations of children who have lived with the disease for some amount of time before they were treated. Uh, you use the word irreversible, and I, I, at least what I understand you to mean by that is it doesn't seem to be reversed by putting an enzyme or replacing the gene. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's forever irreversible. Is that, is that true? I mean, we don't know. So um, there is probably a window of therapy, and it's different for each disorder. As Joe alluded to, that window of therapy involving MPS1 for bone marrow transplant, that window closes, if I'm not wrong, between two and a half and three and a half years of age. Is that about right, Joe? More or less? Um, and even when we bone marrow transplant San Filippo patients very early, there doesn't seem to be a clinical benefit. So, but if you bone marrow transplant um, manacidosis patients, they see significant benefit much later uh, in life. So those windows are different for each disease and when they close and what different aspects of the disease they close on, uh, that's an unknown question. What I'm getting at is, uh, do you see a potential for maybe stem cell transplants being done after gene therapy or enzyme replacement to potentially recover some lost function? Um, it, it, at this point, in so many ways, in terms of the brain disease, there is an awful lot we don't know. And okay. because I think the disruptions may be developmental, going over and resetting that development may be a very difficult proposition. Okay. Thanks. Certainly. I just want to, I think this issue of irreversibility clearly occurs, and it may vary from tissue to tissue, but I think one of the things we've remarkable to me over the years is that there's changes far more than we ever appreciated by just looking at a patient. I think there is a challenge, and that newborn screening will be our really our future hope for the next generation, but that's one of the current challenges, that there's a lot of disease processes that are permanent based on what we know now. Putting in stem cells into the brain is a great idea, but it is way, way in the future. It's not even close to being beneficial to patients today. So I think there is a challenge, and we, we have a lot of therapies occurring but there's still a lot of disease process we haven't tackled, and you've heard of some of that this morning, and they're just a need. We're, we're fortunate where we are today. There's still a ways to go, though. So, what about the bone? What about the bone well, I think there, I think some of that is irreversible. I think there's, there's structural changes in this bone that may not, we may do a much better job of preventing than we are reversing. I think that's the key. Prevention is probably the realistic goal for most, preventing future damage, not trying to make normal individuals, unfortunately. Sorry. Sorry. Are there any other questions? I'll be here for the entire conference, and I look forward to visiting with all of you whenever you have a chance and you have questions. Thanks so much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you.